We have one more speaker for today, uh, and our last speaker is actually an anthropologist teaching at the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences at the University of Malaya. Her research focuses on the development of indigenous knowledge as an alternative development tools against poverty, and her current research is uh, engaged in the uh, in her current research is. Uh, uh, to, to explore conservation sort of methods of intangible cultural heritage, as well as ways to develop Pua weaving as a, text, uh, as a cottage sort of industry. In fact, um, the exhibition that she has curated last year, uh, textiles, Textile Tales of the Pua Kumbu, is currently being restaged at the University of Malaya. So um, if you have time, I would like to urge you to sort of head over to the University of Malaya sort of art gallery um, to view this exhibition because it's actually uh, really sort of like well put together. Um, so uh, please welcome uh, Waylin Jeffrey Jahom um, to tell us more about her, her, her experience of putting together this exhibition. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. I will try not to make this very slow because it's 3.15. Um, uh, thank you, Ilham Gallery, for having me. And uh, I was actually late this morning because we have about 21 visitors came when I just stepped out. So I missed the first talk, but I hope uh, later time I will be able to connect with you to speak about your work. Okay. Um, Today I'm going to present uh, not about the motif, the design, or about the textile itself, but more about um, how I connect research, uh, social enterprise, uh, conservation, and exhibition all together. Uh, because sometimes when we do uh, this kind of research and work, we tend to separate them and do not see the link between them. So um, I would like to introduce you to the community and also the textile uh, by watching this video because it will be much faster than I'm talking to you. And after that, I will go through my PowerPoints and I will explain to you uh, how we did conservation and connect it with exhibition and connecting it to the indigenous knowledge database with research university where we are trying to uh, keep the tradition alive, sustaining it disseminate the information to the younger generations in order to harvest younger weavers. Please enjoy the The Pua Kumbu, the hand-woven warp ikat textile of the Iban, represents the heart of Iban culture. Depending on the design, it is an historical archive, a mythological or religious story, or a personal tale of the weaver and her relationship with the spirits. Ini bawa ini kuto nama ayah kelkuah amun belabuah. Jadi tu tu ke kelkuah amun belabuah tu amun belabuah rata. Ya, jadi nyawa rarauah kuyah minta tutuah keraja nyaduah buah ngkaramuah mansau sedar. To the Kumai Brang to Yakmanama Kilkiat Gajay Langiat Yatu Panaya Yato Nyawa Sanya Sanya Minta Tumiat Kraja Timiat Bukiat Hejariat Nyadim Prat Once upon a time, the Iban were very close to the gods or Patara in Iban language. The origin of the Pua is believed by the Iban to come from an incident when a man named Mungin saw a beautiful bird in the forest. The bird caught his attention when it flew very close and perched on a nearby branch. Mungin quickly shot it with his blowpipe. The bird tumbled from the tree. What he saw on the ground was not the bird, but a beautiful textile known as Kain Kabat. Mungin picked it up and kept it. He did not know that it belonged to Dara Tinchin Tamaga, 
eldest daughter of a Pathara known as Singalang Burong. She was out looking for her kind everywhere. During her search, she met Mungin and asked him if he had seen any kain lying around. Mungin said that when he shot a bird, it fell down as a beautiful kain. So he gave it back to her. Dara took Mungin as her husband, even though she was already married. She brought him back to the land of the gods while her husband was away on an expedition. Mungin and Dara had a son named Sura Gunting. After a year, Dara's first husband returned home. She then asked Mungin and Sura to return to the Iban world and for their journey to wear a jacket known as Baju Burong and her kain that she had woven. From that day onwards, the jacket and the kain have been passed down to many Iban women so they can weave the same designs and remain close to the gods. And that is how the weaving of Pua Kumbu began. In the early days, before commercial thread was available, the Iban prepared the yarn from a locally grown cotton plant called Taya. There are many different preparation stages. Ngirit, which involves pulling and stretching the yarn horizontally to form the warp base. Ngara, the selection of alternate warp. Muai, to sort out the threads in pairs. And ngabat, which is a tying process. All the raw materials for the natural dyes are harvested from the rainforest. The Iban have traditionally made use of a large number of plants to produce a range of rich, beautiful dyes. The Onkudu is a tree plant. The roots that are harvested for dyes produce a rich dark red or brown colour. The Rangat plant produces an indigo colour in many different tones. It has been domesticated and planted around the longhouse or in the farm. The Aka Panawa Landa is used to obtain yellow colour dye. It is a large, woody climbing vine. The Ankarabai grows in the wild but has also been domesticated near the longhouse. Leaves are plucked from the stems and then all ingredients are chopped, ground finely or pounded or mixed with water. For the Ankudu dye, if couple of quicklime is added, the colour will turn brown. <laughs> the yarn is rubbed and turned in the trough. The yarn and dye are boiled so that the colour is absorbed. This Akapanawa Landa vine for yellow dye is harvested from the wild forest and the yarn is soaked in this mixture overnight. The following day, as the final stage, the yarn combination is heated in a pot before being mixed, cleaned and dried. Oh. Indigo dyeing with rungat starts by placing the yarn in cold water with the raw leaves. It is then immersed 
into a hot solution of rungat. Kapu or quicklime is added to fix the colour to the yarn that is then boiled. Through oxidation, within an hour of the immersing process, the colour comes out in rich indigo. The unkarabai leaves are covered with water and boiled in a pot. The mixture is then poured into a wooden trough before the additional pounded ingredients of betel nut and piper beetle or sireh leaves with kapo are added. The yarn is dipped into the combination, turned until it is well saturated and left to soak before it is dried under the sun. After the dye process, yarns are further prepared by tying sections to build up the pattern. In order to prepare for the weaving process, the yarns are unfolded and carefully arranged on a wooden frame. Before the actual weaving begins, the side sections of the unfolded yarn, known as ana or ara, are carefully arranged. Nanun, or weaving, is done using a backstrap loom placed in a convenient spot within the longhouse. The final stage involves finishing of the top and bottom edges. This is called crow feet pattern. Dreams are an important design source and motives often represent elements from a weaver's dream. A dream can be the source of inspiration or as a way of communication to the weaver that the gods have given her permission to weave a potent design. The Nga ritual is only performed to fulfill the master weaver's dream and only involves the red Ankudu plant or roots. Some of the ingredients include wild ginger, oil from the nuts of the kapayang tree, palm salt, quicklime, rice gruel, and the barrio hill salts used as alum to fix dye to the fiber. It is on the last day that the weavers mix all of the ingredients together before immersing the yarn and letting it stand for a last night. In this ritual, before the cotton yarns are dyed, they have to undergo a complex procedure called mordanting. This process allows the colors to adhere to the yarns and makes the yarns color fast. The ceremony ends with a bath at the river. This whole ritual takes place over a week, going on both day and night. The men build simple racks to dry the yarn. Arab ke Tuhan lalu berkat ke buang siang hari Tuhan nurun ka On the final morning the yarn is sent outside 
and left for about a week to rest in the evening dew and sunshine during the day. Throughout history, women have always been associated with textile arts. No matter what materials are used, no matter what form of culture is referenced, their participation has remained constant in influencing, shaping and evolving their numerous and varied techniques. I guess the video says it's all. <laughs> okay, uh, this video is the excerpt from all the videos that I have at the exhibition from last year. Um, and, and this year, the approach is more towards as, uh, explaining step by step in a more educational way, because this is just like a kind of commercial to explain um, very briefly about what's happening. So the second series this year um, is, uh, is uh, um, curated based on the constructive criticism from last year's from especially from good friends who came over and to tell me about the opinions of certain of the videos yeah uh, actually a few of the friends who came to the exhibition last year are seated there and and they are again coming this year so so anyway so this exhibition is called uh, polysensory intermedia exhibition because um, I emphasize on a few techniques where we are not just hanging the clothes or textile of um, the textile itself, but more towards like to introduce not just the textile, but to make visitors understand about each of the motif and also the design for each of the textile. And um, uh, if you look at the, um, the Ilham Gallery uh, picture uh, in the last page, uh, that is how I arrange the textile, like on the left hand side are the old textile where it has been um, woven at least 10 foot by 5 foot uh, width. And then on the right hand, it is a kind of shawl like I'm wearing now. So it is called the Secret of Journey this year uh, because I'm trying to inform the public that this textile has gone through a lot of transformations not only in its functionality, but also its perceptions, um, the weaver's perceptions towards uh, the usage, uh, the creations, and also the interpretations of the Pua Kumbu itself. So it has um, uh, gone through a lot of transformations uh, because in the past there were enemies and all the rituals and also the practices, the taboos that they have observed is very much related to the cosmology and belief system. Uh, but now they are Christians, so as you can see in the video, they were uh, chanting uh, Christian uh, prayers uh, in Iban language, but at the same time, they are observing the taboos and also the uh, rules and regulations as what they have been taught. So there is a kind of uh, syncreticism uh, in anthropological words to describe their situations. So it was not easy for me to... Um, uh, to put it out there uh, in exhibition because a lot of questions was asking are they Christians or are they enemies you know so it's hard to tell the public about how these two belief system uh, can be one structure that actually sustain the traditions okay because in Sarawak especially uh, when the missionary came Anything which is not Christian, not Christians, you have to throw it in the river and you have to stop to do it, you know. So, so this is one of the things that actually kills the art and also the um, tradition of the indigenous people uh, because uh, all the uh, traditional artifacts, either they have to stop doing it or they have to throw it in the river. So if you would uh, dive in the river, you will find a lot of treasures actually. Yeah. And, um, and especially for the uh, longhouses, uh, uh, Iban longhouses in Sarawak, a lot of these longhouses has totally stopped weaving uh, because they are Catholics, they are Christians. Anglican, they are quite more open towards uh, embracing Christianity um, and, and, and still observing the uh, regulations of the uh, old uh, religion structure. Uh, okay, but surprisingly, uh, this longhouse, uh, they are coming from a very uh, pious, uh, strong 
church, a denomination called Sidang Injil Bonio. However, uh, it is the only longhouse that seems to uh, be able to mobilize a lot of weavers to keep to the traditional uh, methods and ways and also to observe the taboos and beliefs in producing this cloth. I mean, it's amazing how many kind of taboos they have to observe. Even uh, if they are doing something, you cannot ask them what they are doing. You know, they will uh, be um, totally stop and, and pause and said, I'm not going to continue it. And, and the master weaver actually uh, blamed me of one of the colors that didn't work because I was asking her, I said, how much did you put in the basin? She said, if it doesn't work, I'm going to blame you. And true enough, it was not red enough for her. So I was to blame, yeah. So just to prove her point that, you know, even though you don't believe it, but you have to observe. Okay, so this is the problem when I bring other foreign researchers or even local researcher, they uh, fail to to uh, to observe all these uh, regulations and rules because uh, they feel that you know they are irrelevant towards this culture, so they can just uh, click their cameras, click 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 click, flashing flashing, and all this kind of stuff as you've seen in the video. So most of my footages, you you could hear clickings and flashings and everywhere. So in uh, uh, in the second series of the ex uh, exhibition, I only use some of the shots from the last year's videos, and and this year is much more personal. Uh, you do not see any clicking or flashing, and you do not see any GoPro cameras on the head. You know, it's very intimate, up close, personal uh, uh, to portray the daily life, um, because this is what that is supposed to be. So I'm just going to move on to my. Yes. So the content of my uh, presentation today is more to speak about the uh, community conservations and then text titles of Wakumu Polysensory Intermediate Exhibition. Okay. Um, uh, through my journey as an anthropologist, I have been taught to observe, to record, and to document. Okay. But I was never taught to exhibit and to share. We, as academics, we only share with fellow academics who read, who criticize, who write review about our works, but we never ask the opinion of the public about how your research has been done, what is your analysis, and how would us as researchers and academics convey our analysis and findings to the very people that we would like to help. You know? So I'm, I'm kind of... Um, uh, deviating for that uh, uh, traditional anthropologist uh, research uh, that one of the professors from Cambridge University was telling me that you are not a real anthropologist. I said, well, I am applied anthropologist, which every traditional anthropologist actually do not want to talk about it. And especially when I said I'm an academic activist anthropologist, made it even worse. Yeah. Okay, so in this research, there are a few objectives. So it is actually funded by high, high Impact Research at University of Malaya. And the last objective was actually I added it uh, because it was not even in the key performance index when I received this huge lump sum of money. But when we speak about high impact research, we do want to give impact to the community that we are working with, not just impact to the people who do research and give us money, not just that many publications. So. I was questioning about what does it really mean, publications? Is it just general academics writings, books, publications, or newspapers, you know? How many people would read journals, articles, and books that we publish as academics? Only us academics and those who are interested. But it is not fair if we do not uh, share these publications with public, because publications, public actions, you know, that's how it's spread it. So this exhibition is actually trying to share whatever our research finding at the university to the public that suited different edges. So um, last year when I organized this exhibition, a lot of people at the university were very skeptical. Until the, until the last day, we were not even helped by any uh, of the members of the university except uh, five of us in the team. And this year it's even worse. It's only me, my husband, my two children, and my two fellows. Yeah, because like um, uh, most academics do not see that there is a need for such exhibitions. And believe me, that most public universities in Malaysia, they do not receive public visits. 
to the gallery. The museum really become museums, you know. The curators become, the curators are archiving themselves the same way they archive the artifacts. So I was telling one of the directors, I said, are you one of the artifacts, you know, like. <laughs> okay, so that's why I chose the art gallery to exhibit all this textile because I would like to bring the essence of traditionalism into modern way of looking at this traditional textile that can be worn, not just hanging as sacred clothes. However, I always say, you do not have to always hang your art. You can also wear your art. I'm wearing my art. Okay, this piece is called Rabai Bedayong. Don't ask me to translate because that is name. Like I cannot translate my name. Yeah? So each of the piece of this textile has its own identity, has its name, has a rhyme. Sometimes there's an elaborate story attached to it. I will show you at the end of this presentation. And it's very important uh, because uh, if we just hang anything in the gallery or museum without any explanations and, uh, and without uh, visitors interacting with it, then our work is meaningless. Okay? I, I do not mean to criticize any of the curatorship, but I'm just presenting the way I exhibit the textile. Okay. However, how would we know the meaning of the textile? as we are only researchers and academics. We do not know unless we really work with the community. And very often, researchers, local or foreign, we always act like we know everything and the local people do not know anything. Yeah? But this time I do it differently. I went to the local community, I said, I don't know anything. Please tell me. Only then you really can access them. And I make it as uh, as compulsory for every weaver that I work with, they have to know every design that they own as their cultural heritage within the families. Uh, because they are so used to weave other people's design, they almost forgot their own heritage design. So through this research, we actually managed to, um, uh, to revive about 237 names of, of the design. But they have only woven about 120 pieces in hard copy to really see how the design looks like. Believe me, most of this design they have never seen before, but it comes from the collective memories narrative, a method that uh, I have imposed to them for the past three years. You know, please remember, please remember. If you don't remember now, you get sick, you even don't remember, and it's going to get worse. So, so what I did every time for the uh, recess, especially when I go alone, when I go with groups, I don't do it because there's a lot of uh, intervention, interruptions, and then it affects their memories. So at the time when I go uh, for my research all by myself, I will group them together. And sometimes I call the other cousins from the other long house. So they would stay and they will talk about their childhood, about what they have seen in the long house, about what they have seen that have been shown by their mothers, their grandmothers, and, and I write it down. I document everything, bits and pieces, and then finally, one fine day, I would just sit with them and say, okay, now tell me the story. These are the motifs that you have put together. Have you seen this design? Have you seen this motif? Most of the time, the master weaver said, maybe I've seen it in my dreams. No? Yeah. Of course, they have seen it in their dreams. They have heard about it. Uh, tacit knowledge is something that they live with. It's just that uh, how, to, uh, how to extract it is another question, you know, because it's not easy to make people to share their knowledge. And, and true enough, their ancestors or their grandmothers, their mothers have never told them about what they have been woven because it's a taboo to talk about it until it's finished. So in fact, uh, the rules um, within the structure of weaving actually kills the tradition because weavers are not supposed to talk about it. They're only supposed to produce. Okay, but um, uh, I mentioned to them, now that you are Christians, you can talk about it. I said, if you don't start to share about it, it's going to die, and you are not going to be able to pass it down to your uh, younger generations. So those are the threats that I throw to them. So finally, it works. So at the exhibition um, today, there are 20 different designs hanging, which was purely from this research which you will not find in, in a shop or souvenir shop. So if you want to have it, you have to hurry, you know? Okay. So 
Uh, so anyway, so uh, giving power to, uh, to the community to do conservation gives them sense of ownership. Uh, because all this time, they have only been weaving other people's design and not their design. So it was a very good move because they almost lost everything. They do not even have uh, the old copies of the hard copy of the Pua Kumbu. And sometimes um, uh, they have to ask from the other cousins who have not moved with them in another longhouse. However, because each of these designs have intellectual uh, property rights, so they would have to ask for compensations to copy the other's design and also to create new ones. Okay, however, uh, it is not lost totally because uh, there is a trick within Pua Kumbu uh, since they share a few different motifs in each of these designs. So if they put the motifs together, it actually creates one design. And depends on how they would like to read the motif up, down, left, right, or what they mix with the other motif that create a different design, they can actually tell the story. And, and with the master weaver I have now, uh, she's like a walking dictionary. You just show her, she started to um, recite the rhyme on each piece. So that's why every time I go, I make sure I prepare at least my handphone on so I can record what she says. Because the next day she said, no, I didn't say that. I forgot. You know? She's 77 years old. But I can see that for the past two years, especially this year, she started to lose it. You know? All the things that she said last year, she said, no, I didn't say that until I showed her the video. So it's really crucial for uh, conservation. Okay. However, the conservation getting really tough. Okay, because most of the weavers that you've seen in the video, they are old. I mean, not old, they are very wise. Yeah? So their wiseness might be lost in a few years. Yeah? So we, we are all getting wise. And, and we know that even at this age, I sometimes do not know where I keep my handphone. A few times I left it in the fridge. So one more to say, those who are 77 years old, you know, we call them sweet 17. Anyway, so I, I, I told them, as, as, as academics and researchers, I'm a learner, and, and they are the masters. So by giving this power to these women, it really um, motivates them to, to work together with researchers. Okay. Um, okay, so this is how we did our conservations. First, we identify all the designs. I said, tell me, if you can't write, tell me, what have you heard of the names? So I write it down for a few days, weeks. It took me one year only to get 237 names. Yeah? And, and, and I still can work another 20 years. I think there are many out there. Yeah? And then we trace back designs to Family Longhouse. In fact, uh, seven of the designs that we managed to retrieve, which they have never woven before, we found it in the other Longhouse. Happened to be their first cousin who did not move away from the last migrations. So, in fact, this conservation also, like uh, in Malaysia, we call it Jejak Kase, where we actually trace the love of the sisters of weavers, you know. So, we managed to um, bring them together. Uh, it was last month. Um, we brought seven master weavers together who are in their 80s, 90s for the very first time after 50 years. So they were actually talking about, not about how they miss each other, they were talking about Pua Kumbu design. I said, wow, that's wonderful. So I just record everything what they say, but I haven't transcribed it yet. It's very interesting story they say. However, there is a bit of huddles because they were speaking in archaic Iban language that I bought a very thick dictionary, Iban English, but you don't find those words in this. Why? Because this, this dictionary was published by two foreigners who has been researching in Borneo for the past, uh, past 40 years. So some of this Iban language actually has additional words that we would like to include in the, in the dictionary as well, which are not known to the younger generations. Yeah? So after we trace back designs to family longhouse, we actually have the structure, and then we assign weavers who have the copyright to weave this, and they produce each one. So the, for the past one year, we only managed to have about uh, 95 ready, and the rest are still not uh, ready. Yeah. Okay. So first conservation, you know about it. So how are you going to sustain it? That is a very big question. So the only way to sustain this weaving is by selling. So 
You sell one, you don't have, you have to weave again. And if it's so, you have to weave another one. So practice makes perfect. So the first edition that they weaved was not very good design. It was not very clear. But the second time, the third time they did it, it was really beautiful. And only then I dared to hang it in the gallery this year. So um, by selling, it's not like just earning money, but we are disseminating the information, the knowledge towards publics, you know, uh, because each piece will come with a name. But I always promise my friends that I will send the stories, but I have not done it yet because I've some. Um, we are still compiling the stories. Hopefully, we will come up with a book of references for each design with the stories, complete stories. I think it's going to take me another three, four years to do that. Uh, but anyway, so, so it is a way for us to keep on weaving, which is to produce in order to sustain this knowledge. So that's why we have a social enterprise uh, that actually help the weavers to earn income. And, and when they see the income coming in, they are also motivated to produce, you know, it's the only way. Okay, so these are a few of the designs that has been revived. Okay. This one is called, uh, okay, this one is Buah Nabau. There are a lot of buah nabau, it doesn't look like this. So this is more intricate. Yeah? This weaver is 56 years old. This one is a bit complicated in terms of name. It's called Gelanggang Langit Jerit Betampung Bintang Tiga. It's some sort of a, a space for the three stars roaming. Yeah? Literally translated. Okay? So there's, this is the star. I only know this is the star, and this is the star, this is the star. The rest, I'm not quite sure. Okay, but we do have the documentations about each of these motifs. Yeah? And this is Belulai Betangkai. It is the ferns and also the uh, plants which are crawling, creeping in the forest. Yeah? So, okay. So these are the things that we sell at the gallery and also our temporary shop at UM. Like this one, for example, is called Aki Ongkuak Beliwong Salam Beliwong, which means uh, water strider, you know, but the name is very long, but it's actually water strider. And, and this one is called also Aki Ongkuak Salam Beliwong, but different versions on different colors. And, and this one is actually the uh, design from the skirt, which is called kain or bidang. But I, I asked her to try to make it as a shawl. So she actually produced four pieces of this and it's all sold out. Yeah? Okay. And, and this one is, uh, I, I do not know the name, I forgot. Okay. And, and these are all on comb cotton. This is a silk. Okay. So... Why I do this? Because I'm an anthropologist. I never studied visual anthropology before. It just came to me one time. And then, uh, I mean, visual anthropology has existed for as long as anthropology has existed. You know, if you heard about the work of Margaret Mead, Franz Boss, uh, uh, for those anthropologists out there, they are actually collecting data, visual data, okay? And, uh, and there is the work by uh, Claude Lévi-Strauss, I think, the French would know him very well, a structuralist, where he imagined and he actually took back all the other uh, visuals from the countries that he visited, but he, he never really go to the place where he was talking about in his book. Okay? But, and contemporary visual anthropology builds to a large extent on this legacy of these scholars. However, they have never done what I'm doing exhibiting it to the public. They are just showing it to the academics, you know? Okay, so this is the visual anthropology extended, I call it. One day I might have this discipline, visual anthropology extended, where I include polysensory intermediate exhibition as, as part of the anthropological work. You know, like it is um, data which is documented and being presented to public. And believe me, last year, for some part of the sections in exhibition, we actually have our youngest visitors was 10 months old. His mother said, I'm very interested in the textile, but I do not have a nanny to take it. So I bring it in. Is he okay? I said, yeah, yeah. Just bring your stroller in. So um, I said, try to put your baby in front of the story. 
uh, 4K TV story rooms. So he said, yeah, but it's a bit too loud. The images is not, it's, uh, it's a bit too adult for a baby. I said, try. So this baby was sitting there. He, his mother thought that he was sleeping. He wasn't sleeping. He was wide awake. There are seven stories. It was on and on and on. She kept on checking on him. He's still watching. And then when the seven stories finished, she tried to take him out. He started to cry. And then his mother put him back. He stopped crying. I said, well, just leave him there. I think he will be fine, you know. So three times his mother tried to take him out. He was crying. So that's how we know that it is also quite effective to the children uh, because of the images that we put. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's not violent stories. It's about, you know, it's, uh, it's multi-colors uh, presentation where it actually attracts not just children. And we also have a visitors of 91 years old. You know, he came. He was working very slowly. And he was sitting at every section of the exhibitions until the end. He came three times. And uh, I actually asked the security guard at the counter to mark one. Every time when you see people come in, you mark one. You don't have to write anything. So 25 days, we counted. There are 3,000 plus marking on the papers. I hope she didn't just mark it by herself. But it is to count how many numbers of people has gone through that door to the exhibition. So 25 days, 3,000 plus. I think it's, it's, it's excellent. Yeah? So I, I now know that you know, exhibitions to uh, present research to the public is very effective, especially when you do it in that way, visual, media, and, uh, and also um, uh, touch screens. Yeah? Okay, so it is also to uh, connect public up close with personnel, with artisans and the art. Um, I will show you the pictures. Okay. So this is the introductions, where we actually have the introduction video. So some of the videos that you watch is actually excerpted from these origins videos. It explains where's the uh, poor combo coming from, and uh, I do not put anything in that section. Okay, so that people can focus on the video. And then, this is our masterpiece. We call it Poor Explorer. Yes, you have to come and see this, because it's really amazing. <laughs> Okay, it was, a, it was a machine. It is not actually a machine. If you have learned geography, you used to, we used to have this table that has light under so that you can trace maps. Yeah? So I was telling my team, I said, look, I really would like public to understand what's the meaning of the symbol. Because if you look at all the symbols, you, you wouldn't know what to guess. You know? So I said, I would like to be able to show to visitors the symbol, and then it turns into reality. Okay. Um, because I'm not a programmer, I do not understand all these techniques, IT, and, uh, and also technology, I say. So please build me one. I say, to light it up, uh, can we build um, the table which is similar to the geography table that we used to have, I said, that have lights, okay, so that you can have design. I said, yes. So we built this, and we actually use this um, morphing programming where you can see the symbols slightly turn into the reality and back. Uh, last year we put text, but people don't really read the text, I found. So it's a bit a hassle to put it in the applications. And furthermore, uh, Apple has bought the program that we used last year, Komatayo. So we cannot use and buy that license anymore. It's thousands ringgit. So we changed to a program called Vuforia. It's not like phobia, Vuforia. But it only works on Android, of course. It doesn't work on iPhone. So if you have iPhone, it doesn't work. Uh, because we can only make it work on iPhone if we purchase Apple software. Yeah. OK, so what Explorer do is you just upload the application. It is actually available on a Play Store. We just put it last Friday. We have to pay a certain amount of money, but it's easier for people before they come. Upload on, uh, on Play Store. Uh, just look for Pua Explorer. Yeah? And then you can point on the, this table and also this thing here. OK, last year, so many people said, why can't we get this? So this year, I have it printed on canvas. You can choose leather canvas, normal canvas whichever price that you want, and the same application, you can point it here and you can bring it home. So now you can bring this whole machine back home. Yeah? 
Okay, so the next to uh, the Pua Explorer, we have the origins and also the introductions of Pokumbu, uh, like what you have watched before. But we also hang a lot of this. And each of these Pua, actually, if you point your smartphone, you will be able to get all the ident identifications. So we try to blend um, modern technology because everybody has their smartphones. Yeah. So uh, there's no point to tag because they wouldn't read it anyway. And, and you will have to make a very bright light in the room if you have to read the tag. Okay, so this is our longhouse 3D replica. This is the picture I took this morning at 8.30 in the morning. She has already started to prepare to weave. So this is the replica of our longhouse in 3D. And it is actually... Um, I'm, I'm very proud of it uh, because even the uh, president of National University of Singapore, it's very hard to please a Singaporean, yeah? So, <laughs> seriously, he came in and said, wow, long house. So we actually took a lot of pictures there and he said, this brings me back to the 1980s when I used to bring a lot of students to the long house in Baram, he said. So I, I felt very proud of the 3D replica long house. It was not an easy thing to set up this because we actually have to number every piece of the picture when we print it. And then we have to do the exact thing. And having 10 foot high, and uh, yeah, this room is a bit too big. Yeah, you just have to come and see. You know, like it's, it's about this size, and we have about, um, we have about 25 pieces to assemble. And, and, and the person who assembled for us has been doing wallpaper all his life. He said, this is the hardest wallpaper I ever stick on the wall. I said, try to learn. Anyway, so this is our story room. So our story room, to have this very nice effect, I, I, I put the backdrop. We used to put sticker, but sticker you cannot recycle. So this time I put backdrop and it's more full. And... Um, Last year, we had it in a very small room, but we had one visitors of 45 children, and they all want to watch together, and we didn't have enough space. So finally, I moved it to a bigger room, and now we do not have any bench here, but people feel free to sit on the floor yeah, and, and to watch uh, seven stories. So this is the QR code. You just have the application from uh, Play Store, and then you can just do your smartphone everywhere. Every data will come out. Uh, so this is a way of sharing uh, because we would like people to know that everything that we put in the exhibition gallery, there is an explanation and why it is there. Okay, so this is the invitation for you to come to the gallery. <laughs> That's my phone number. If you want to have a group tour, please contact me. So now I'm going to show you um, two sh very short videos. Okay, this is called visual media, where we have this canvas picture. You point your smartphone after you download the applications. You can actually see the, the video. Yes. So she was weaving actually at 4 o'clock in the morning after I gave her the headlamp. There's no electricity. There's no um, chlorinated water which actually is very good for the natural dye. Yeah. And the other one is the morphing. Uh, yes. Yeah, this is the morphing programming on the Pua Explorer. So you just point. <coughs> it's not very clear in the video. You can try to play it. Okay. I'm just trying to shoot try to show you the monkey. That is the monkey, but on the piece of the poor kumbu, you hardly uh, differentiate whether it's a monkey or a dog. They almost look similar. But in order to understand the whole story, you have to know what it is. Yes. Okay. Okay. So now I'm just going to show you the last video, the story which is suitable for every age, from nine months to 100 years old.
It is in Iban, but there's a subtitle. Udah nya ya aku meang alu nyaudara nya jadi ngokleang ah jadi ngokleang kira ka setahun nya jadi ngokleang baru ka bisik tubuh mane ku meang kai nya ku meang ngemai labo dua ige sia sige sia sige ya me baru ka nyawa nak muka muka ka unsur ribut nya bisik jalai ribut puluh tu is keling that is ku meang dia husband and wife alo taban so she wants to go and fetch Water with the pumpkin shell. Walau bat dengan batayang. Terus ante keliang datai, nadai kumang datai. And then bunso ribut, which is the strong wind, passed and kept her in the big tree, which is known as karak merayu. And then he was waiting for her. He couldn't find her. So he turned himself into the monkey so that he can climb the tree. So that's him. So he was asking the fish in the river, which is called ikan bam. Have you seen my wife? He said, No, I don't know. So Kaling went up and then he met the peasant called Burung Ruai and asked her, Have you seen my wife? And Kaling's dog was asking the snake and also the turtle. And then finally they pointed out that there she is, she's hidden by the spirit of Karak Merayong, of the, of the tree. And when they met, they live happily ever after. Okay. So this is the kind of stories that we showed in the story room that actually captures attention of uh, a lot of people from different ages. If I have not seen it myself last year, I wouldn't be able to say this. So hopefully this year we will have more visitors, especially school children. Yeah. Thank you.